<laughs> Welcome back to the interview couch. I am now here with Shams Giorgiani, who is, well, you are basically a lot of things in this company, but one of the things you do is kind of get games, look at new franchises, and find what we're supposed to publish. So um, you found War of the Roses, am I right? Uh, actually, no. Um, just to clarify, what I do at Paradox is that I... Uh I, I find and sign the new games. That is correct, though. But what I, War of the Roses was actually not one of the games that I had to find because uh, basically we either uh, find a game or somebody finds us and we vet the games and we decide we want to do them. Or in the case of War of the Roses, we had our own vision and we had this dream of making this kind of game for a very long time. So um, for us, it was all about finding the right partner, right, finding the right developer. And uh, after have, having worked with Fat Shark once, it's what, it was actually a perfect match. So it was really, uh, it was a good fit for us. And finally, we had found the partner that we wanted to work with for uh, one of our dream games, essentially, to just have this kind of uh, uh, medieval uh, hack and slash multiplayer game. So War of the Roses has gotten a lot of positive reception and people seem to like it a lot. Do you feel that it met up to kind of what you expected and kind of what your vision and dream was in the start? Um, I, I mean, I remember one of the first me meetings that we had with uh, well, with Fat Shark and uh, Morton. I think that we didn't talk that much about the specific stuff. We talked about um, mud and blood and steel. I think we had like 15 minutes just talking about how the mud and glistening blood should feel and look on steel. And so, I mean, it was, uh, it was one of those moments actually where um, we kind of immediately hit off when it came to the gameplay and design. So the challenge essentially for us was to decide, okay, so what additional fringe features do we want to add to the mixture? Because we knew that we could quite quickly understood that we share the same vision when it came to the hack and slash gameplay. That wasn't the big question. The idea was that, okay, so how do we handle the, the finer points? How do we want to handle the health, uh, the health system? Or uh, do we want to have perks? Or we, would we want to have some kind of kill streak system uh, at the time? And I mean, I mean, whenever you start working on a game, you ha always have to look at the different other games that are popular at the time, and Call of Duty being one, and Battlefield being another. Uh, we discuss: would there be a sensible way for us to do like kill streaks or something that would make sense for this game? And if we were to do kill streaks, and we talked about maybe you could call in a hail of arrows, uh, similar ways to the airstrike. Um, and I think that. I think ultimately kill streaks was something that was removed, uh, was put back on the, the drawing board, and we focused on other things and went for a way more, I should say, hardcore uh, gameplay experience rather than going with a more arcadey uh, experience. I think. So was the game like the goal from the start, having a very skill-based game, or did you imagine it to be more of a hack and slash, arcadey type game from the start? Uh, since it's a paradox game, we wanted to. Uh, ensure that it had a uh, a very large skill component. I think that one of our unofficial paradox slogans is uh, not for dummies. Uh, that's that's one of the slogans that we have and uh, often when I look for new games um, I try to um, I try to find games that generally we our games demand a lot from the gamer <laughs> and the gamer demands a lot from our games. So it's a kind of give and take kind of relationship. So um, and I think you see that in the 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 strategy games that Paradox does. You see that in Magicka. It has a lot of uh, humor and stuff, but also it's very demanding at the same time. So when it came to War of the Roses, we knew that it was the same kind of game. Uh, um, that we knew that this was the kind of game that the more time people invested in it, the better they would become, and the more the game would reward them. So, and I think that that's one of the hallmarks of all Paradox games. I think you'll never find a casual game from Paradox or something that's super, super in the middle that appeals to everybody. I think that one of the uh, main developers, uh, Yuan Pilastet, the CEO of Arrowhead, uh, he has a really good, good motto when it comes to Arrowhead and their, the games they make. And they say that a game for everyone is a game for no one. Because if you try to cater to every need there is out there, you'll end up with a, like a, a really shitty game, basically. So, and uh, we try to really uh, adhere to that as well because, uh, I mean, essentially, we've always made niche games, right? That's That's been our thing. We try to give 
um, the PC gaming community, the types of games that nobody else would dare to do because it's too niche, it's too weird, and I mean, that's we, how we made all our business. And that's, that's how it's always been, and that's probably how it always will be. Um, Can I add to that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, uh, sorry. No, I, I no just worse. totally like, jumped in. He's so big. That's uh, what she said. <laughs> So, so one of the, the things that my, one of my philosophies, and I think that this is why I fit into Paradox quite easily when I first joined, I know I was like, okay, he's coming from a bigger, like kind of EA and it's a bigger uh, organization. Is he going to fit in? I think I fit in better here than I fit in there. But one of my key things is like not, not designing your game to the lowest denominator. Right. And I think that that is, I mean, it's the same basic concept, but that's something that I really truly believe in and that I wouldn't want War of the Roses to ever do. Yeah. Like, and, and it is kind of scary though, because you are basically making a game that not everybody's gonna be able to play. Yeah. It, there is, it, this is a difficult game and yeah. it is a skill-based game and that goes back to like the strategy games. Even our strategy games are a bit they require more. It's more about the time, but like, they're really hard. I, I mean, those games even like I'm a little bit like scared of. But I think that that's great because there is a huge audience that does like those that get overlooked or they're forced to play something that is maybe uh, you know not going to challenge them enough. So, but I'll let you go back to your yeah yeah. Th and I think that you stay. Okay. I think that I think that uh, that's exactly right because there are a lot of other game developers and not a lot of other great publishers who are really good at giving those kind of make creating those kind of gameplay experiences. But if you want a kind of uh, something that's uh, more special, something that uh, like you 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 can't get everything. So uh, we 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 selected some of the elements to focus on, and we said that some other things we won't do that, or we'll do it differently. And uh, those are the kind of gameplay experiences I think that we make. And it's it's like you said, it's not for everyone. Yeah, and I think that's a, also a good point that you made that you know just because uh, bigger publishers and and AAA games need to do that, but they need to do that because. You know, they've made huge investments into their products. They've pushed sure. technology. They've helped us. Sure. They've helped us get to where we're at now by doing those things. Yeah. So it, it's a it's a it's a healthy relationship. We do need EA. We do need Activision. Yeah. We do need the Modern Warfare's, even though people don't maybe don't 100% agree with that. But we do need those because we need those games that a lot of gamers can play and get into games because a lot of times it's the gateway drug. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. But I think that what what sets uh, maybe Paradox and other smaller, mid-sized publishers apart from the other big ones is that I think that we have we don't have that kind of top-down approach because we never sit down and say, okay, so what kind of game could sell five million copies? That's that's never a discussion we have. Uh, and I mean, when you when you make the super big games, that's that's the first question you need to be able to answer. And uh, and since we don't have to answer that question, we actually start. Uh, in another space and we talk about okay so what kind of game do we want to make what kind of game are is are people asking for why is why isn't anybody making a x-wing versus tie fighter game or just a tie fighter game so what happens in a sense essentially when we don't have to ask that kind of question because once you have to ask that kind of question it's like okay so if i want to sell five million copies what do i need to do okay it probably has to be a shooter right yep. or it needs to be an open world kind of game and it probably needs to be take place in an open world setting or in, um, or a modern war setting okay so suddenly you're you're starting to design a game in order to be able to hit a specific sales mark instead of discussing what kind of amazing game could i make and we end up in a situation and this is this is something that uh the fred uh or Paradox CEO has pioneered is that we try to look at things from a top-down approach instead of the uh, uh, from a bottoms-up rather than top-down. And essentially, we, what we ask ourselves when we do a question, uh, when we start doing a project, is that okay? So, what's the worst-case scenario? Like when we started looking at War of the Roses, we're like, okay, so this game, how how poorly could it do? What's the worst-case scenario? And we take a look at the numbers, and we're like, can we take that kind of hit? I'm like, yeah, we can probably take that kind of hit. So let's just do it and see what happens. Worst case, it it 
it does poorly and it does those numbers that we talked about but if it does great that's fantastic but we're not betting the farm or the family or your daughter or my wife or whatever on the on the success of the game if it's if it's great fantastic but you know what we just, at the end of the day we took a chance and tried to make a game that we wanted to play yeah sometimes i don't know i talk to a lot of developers and it's like uh they're, they're they show their game to us and there's no fire in their eyes i'm like guys do you do you like this game even it's, it's <laughs> like sometimes you don't see that kind of passion and if you, you don't if you're not passionate about the games that you're making what's the fucking point yeah you just cursed i'm i cursed before me That's some amazing. somebody has to do it so i mean uh, i think that the passion is a uh important quality when it comes to making games and uh it has to be tempered with uh, good producers. <laughs> so basically, War of the Roses was an exception. <laughs> yeah, because we actually have a passionate producer. No, but um, uh, the, the, I think that kind of approach, not looking at uh, the top numbers, uh, is very healthy for us because we... We, of course, would love to have a 5 million seller. Of course, please give us a 5 million seller. But we don't have to make a 5 million seller. We don't have to like close down 50 different studios be just because we didn't sell 2.5 million or whatever. But sales also isn't our only measurement of su success. No. I mean, it, for, for Paradox, being able to fund a lot of these projects and being able to give pe uh, smaller developers a chance to like live out their dream yeah. is also a huge reward and something that's successful like i remember there's a question on twitter and uh there's is a, a dev mike action mm. acton yeah sorry yeah. acton action yeah. same thing uh <laughs> mike he, yeah mike was uh he said what how would you measure your success yeah. in the games industry and w one guy replied you know he would have a chain full of baftas uh and a Ferrari and, and some other things. And for me, honestly, I mean, of course those things are cool. Maybe not the chain of BAFTAs. I would like to have a BAFTA. Mm -hmm. But more for me, it would be like being able to uh, have a studio that was created around like part of my efforts. And I helped push and lead to get uh, that hires people and gets people working in the games industry that that's their dream That's passion helping them fulfill something that they've set out to do in the same way I did it I mean it took me a while to get into industry. I've wanted to make games since I was a kid So it was like it took me longer to get there than I would have liked but now that I'm here I want to also try and help make that happen for others similar. Yeah, I think that for, f Besides sales, which is always good what drives me or makes me happy is that when somebody just today we had a post in our forums who somebody just wanted to thank us that we made uh, the weird kind of games that we make because nobody else does does that and that was actually uh that made my day because that i mean those are the kind of things that really affirms that what we're doing the kind of stuff that we're doing makes sense uh so that's that's yeah. one of my motivators yeah i think i mean I would say pretty much 99.9% .9 of the people that are in this industry yeah. uh, that are up on the dev side there what they want to do is they want they want people they want to create something that somebody gets some type of joy out of and yeah. they enjoy themselves and they have fun so you know I, I want to thank all the people that like reach out to me and thank me for the games even though I'm not the only one who's involved I mean there's a lot of us involved uh, just that um, I have the ugliest face, so people like to put me out in public so that yeah. people can mock me. Yeah. Uh, but it's like <laughs> getting getting out there, you know, and uh, you know, I, I get you get a unnecessary amount of attention. Uh, but you know, those people that thank me, I always try and pass those messages along to the whole team because I think, you know, everybody on the team deserves it. Everybody's a part of it. You know, I, I appreciate the finance team, I, you know, because everybody's a part of this to make it happen. If we didn't have these pieces and, you know, in this in giant, you know, concoction and this, you know, Frankenstein beast of a machine, yeah. then none of it would happen. Yeah. And uh, we're getting like f different, right. five different signals from five different producers that we have to start wrapping this up. Uh, if we had five producers, uh, but since we're a small company, we only have one producer, half, and a, producer. half a producer, and a video producer. But he's a good and one. So, so I'm, uh, I'm I'm going to hand the mic back to uh, the host. 
thank you for being the easiest person ever to interview, having like three questions and talking 20 minutes. But thank you for joining me, Shams uh, and Gordon, and speaking about everything. I don't even remember what questions sparked that. But in the end, you, you spoke a lot of wise words. Uh, and that will be it for us from now. And we're moving on back to Matt.